Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Janie Roundtree. I'm the Executive Director of the California Policy Lab at UCLA, and I want to start by thanking you all so much for spending a couple of hours of your afternoon with us here for this training, Policy Briefs 101, Translating Research Findings into Policy Impact. I just want to recognize the incredible variety of people who registered for this training. We have everyone from faculty at UCLA and USC. We have postdoctoral scholars, graduate students. We have nonprofit leaders and community-based organizations and staff who work for community-based organizations. We have staff for elected officials. We have staff who work at big public agencies here in our area in Los Angeles, including the Department of Health Services. We have community health workers. It's a really incredible group. Um, and we're so grateful that you chose to spend your time with us today. Many of you may have signed up for this because you are producing research either together in groups um, or that's your profession. And you might be here to learn how to communicate all of your research findings um, more effectively. Maybe you're a consumer of research in your job every day. We probably all as human beings share the experience of downloading research during the pandemic to try to understand what it said. But no matter who you are, where you're coming from, I hope that the advice that we'll share today on how to effectively communicate or translate research into policy impact uh, will be useful and impactful for you. So, so welcome. This is the first time we've given the training. There will be a survey sent to you. And just thank you so much in advance for answering it. We'll really use it for future versions of this training. And the last thing I'll say before we get started is just a huge thank you to my colleagues, Savannah, Jessica, Etsame, Dr. Brown, others who are co-hosts today um, for all of the work that you put into getting us this far and, and hosting this training today. So thank you. So briefly, our agenda today, we're going to start with logistics and try to answer all of your questions up front about whether you'll have access to the recording or the slides, um, how to participate today, all of those things that might be top of mind for you now. We'll talk a little bit about your host, the California Policy Lab, and the Community Engagement and Research Program, so you know who you're spending time with today. We'll go over the workshop objectives. Then we'll have basically two major training modules. The first, we're going to talk about one way that you can design research projects that have policy impact. Then we're gonna go through a training about how to write a policy brief. And there'll be a number of different topics that we cover there. And then finally, we'll have time at the end for questions. So workshop logistics, first of all, if you're familiar with the webinar format, you will all be muted during the call. We really encourage you to ask any questions that you have in the QA. Um, you should have in your Zoom bar menu a QA function. Please put them um, in there as it occurs to you. If a question really needs to be asked in the moment to clarify a slide, one of the moderators will interrupt me to ask and answer that. But for the most part, we will save questions that you submit throughout the training for the QA session at the end. There are going to be a couple of times when we ask you questions, and if you can, please participate by answering them in the chat. Uh, we might ask you a question about your recent uh, work history and research, or uh, towards the middle of the training, we're going to play a game um, where you're going to suggest alternatives to jargon. So please participate and do so by answering the question in the Zoom chat. Um, I've already covered this, but you'll have an opportunity to ask questions that you want to at the end, even if you haven't submitted them throughout, you can just continue to submit them then. You will be given a handout at the end of this. It will be provided to anyone who registered for the training, and it will have a lot of the detail that we cover in the slides. The slides themselves, which are, I don't know, 80 to 90 slides, are not going to be available, but we really did try to cover all of the key concepts in the handout. The handout will also have links to lots of other resources like sample policy briefs, literature or articles you might wanna read about the topics that we're covering. Um, so you can look forward to that. And then finally, the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available to anyone who registered. We'll be sending out a link after the training um, to make sure you have access to that. It will also be recorded in closed captioning. So just some brief introductions. I'll be leading the first part of the training. 
My name again is Janie. I'm the executive director of the California Policy Labs UCLA site. I've been running this, I founded and run this, the policy lab for about six years. Before that, I worked as deputy chief of staff to Mayor Rahm Emanuel in the city of Chicago and senior counsel to Mayor Mike Bloomberg. So when I'm offering advice about policy briefs, I'm not only speaking from my experience as a co-author of our research publications at CPL, but also in my past life as a policymaker who was often reading policy briefs um, in the hopes of learning things and translating them for impact. I'm joined today by the California Policy Labs Communications Director, Sean Coffey, um, the awesome Sean Coffey, who is a true subject matter expert in policy brief writing, data visualization, editing, um, and how to get your work out to media. So he'll be covering some of those topics a little later on. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brown to introduce herself and her colleagues. Hi there, um, I'm Arlene Brown. I am a general internist and health services researcher and I co-direct uh, the UCLA CTSI and the CTSI's Community Engagement and Research Program, which is helping to sponsor this event. I wanna introduce um, a wonderful colleague, Etsame Aganifer, who is uh, a former White House fellow, who is now an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Health System Science at the Kaiser Permanente Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine. Um, and uh, we hope uh, you have a wonderful two hours and we're looking forward to engaging uh, with you over the next couple of couple hours. Thank you both. The mission of the California Policy Lab is to translate research insights into government impact. And we do this through hands-on partnerships with government agencies performing rigorous research across issue silos. And we build data infrastructure necessary to improve programs and policies that millions of Californians rely on every day. Um, the California Policy Lab works explicitly across sectors. So our work touches on labor and employment, homelessness, economic inclusion, criminal justice reform, education, and health. And we do this intentionally because our mission is to improve people's lives and people are affected often by many of these systems at the same time. And to try to have the impact that we wanna have, we need to understand how all of these things are affecting people's lives. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Brown, I believe, to talk a little bit about SERP before we get into the training. Certainly. Now, first of all, I want to echo Janie's thank you to all of you for joining us today. We're really thrilled by the interest and turnout. Um, additionally, huge thanks to Sean Coffey, Etsame, and behind the scenes, Savannah Carson, Jessica McLaughlin, Stephanie Vassar, and the entire SERP team. Our Community Engagement and Research core program is the core of the UCLA Clinical Translational Science Institute, which is funded by um, NCATS, or the National Center for Accelerating Translational Science. Um, next slide, please. So we partner with community members, organizations, service providers, policymakers, researchers, government, and local health systems to try to identify um, and, and investigate public health priorities. And the goal is really to improve health and health equity um, in LA County. We have a lot of different services and I won't go into all of them, but we basically provide consultation, trainings on community engagement, assistance with community outreach and partnership. Um, we have a newsletter and you are welcome to post uh, uh, community engaged events on that newsletter. We do monthly talks and uh, we have dissemination opportunities. And it's during this work and trying to build out some of these dissemination um, options that we actually started to get a lot of feedback from our community partners about opportunities for helping them publicize and impact policy through their work. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Um, on this list, you see some of our many partners, and they're really the reason we're here today. Um, that Several of them have um, worked with us on every stage of research and dissemination. And they and many of our academic partners have asked us about ways to um, really focus their work more in the policy space. And we were really thrilled when Janie and Sean and the other members of the California Policy Lab 
um, accepted the invitation to work with us on this seminar. And we really are so grateful that they're going to be taking us through their approach, um, which we've learned about from um, many hours of discussions um, and hope that you uh, uh, get as much out of it as we have. So I'm going to turn it back over to Janie. And again, thank you for, for being here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. The um, Community Engage Research Park Program is just incredible. It's such an important resource for our community and thanks for all that you're doing. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about our objectives for today. In this workshop, you're gonna learn some ways to design research projects so that they have policy impact. We're gonna talk about what a policy brief is and why, why you might wanna write one, who your audience is and how to structure your policy brief to reach that audience, how to translate your project findings for policymakers, how to select the best language and data visualization strategies for policymakers, and how to ensure your work is received and heard by your desired audience. And then we'll end with Q&A. So we're gonna start our first uh, training module now, which is talking about research for policy impact. And let me just say that we were asked to talk a little bit about the California policy model why we developed it the way that we did, how we try to ensure that our work has policy impact. But of course, there are many ways to do this. And I, I hope that um, the description of our work today maybe inspires you to think differently, but please don't think that this is the only way to do this work, of course. So before we get started, we're gonna do our first chat participation. We're gonna do an icebreaker. Um, if you can, please answer this question in the Zoom chat. Um, and just love to, for you to share an example of when data or research findings influenced your work, your community, or public policy. Um, and I'll give people a minute to think and write. Again, you're sharing an example of when data or research findings influenced your work, your community, or public policy. Thank you to our initial brave participants. Data is critical to preparation of funding proposals. Absolutely. COVID-19 vaccination rates in various communities and resources to improve canvassing outreach. Surveys of California housing counselors. Um, these are great examples. Um, and I'll, I'll just share one briefly. Um, please continue to, to write them into the chat. I used to work for the city of Chicago and we were really concerned about high school dropout rates. And we ended up partnering with researchers to look at data and understand what was happening and discovered that ninth grade math was the real barrier to staying in high school and then tested some intensive tutoring models. And those um, evaluations were really positive and showed big impacts. And that model is now not only scaling and has scaled at the city of Chicago, but really nationally. So um, these are all great ideas. When we think about research or data that has impact, a lot of times these projects have a, have a few things in common. One, the questions are actionable. It's information you can use. So whether it's for your grant proposal in the first example or in the COVID context, it's something that's very timely um, and that a policymaker can use immediately or a community organization can use immediately to, to act differently. A lot of times impactful research is co-led between researchers and community organizations or policymakers, um, and that makes it more insightful and more rich and more actionable. One um, observation that I'll make from my own career in government is that sometimes research that shows what works is easier to implement. Governments want to do the right thing. They want to be positive. They want to show they want to improve people's lives. It can actually be hard, easier to start a new thing that works than to end funding a thing that doesn't work. Impactful research can also unlock insights from data that hasn't been collected before or administrative data that hasn't been used before. 
Um, and we often find really incredible insights from linking data. So rather than just thinking about health data, you're linking health data and employment data, for example, um, to look at something from a different lens. Perhaps this is common sense, but really rigorous, incredible evidence tends to be more impactful. And even if a community partner or a government agency isn't a researcher themselves, they know when they're looking at credible research that they can act on. And of course, it's got to reach the right audience to be impactful. The California Policy Lab was really designed to do this. Our mission is for research to have a direct impact on government. And when people ask me why we started the California Policy Lab, I share the statistic, which is that every five months, every five months, the California government is going to spend the entire equivalent of Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, his entire net worth. So that's $61 billion every five months, and less than 1% of that spending is informed by data research and evidence. So the government is always going to be the most influential, biggest actor on people's lives, and we need to improve the percentage of its decision making that's actually backed by data and research, and that's what we're trying to do. So when we started the California Policy Lab, we really thought carefully about why is this happening? You know, the, the answer is not that people in government don't want to do the right thing. Most of them are public servants and they are doing their jobs because they want to help people or do the right thing. So why is there this big gap? And I think it's helpful to understand as you're thinking about how to do work that's impactful, what some of these barriers are. So we'll just start with a couple. There's gaps in knowledge. There's often the case when you're designing a program where you don't have the information that you need to set it up. Maybe you run a nonprofit and um, you're trying to develop a new program model and you're looking out there for the evidence to support it. Um, more often than not, it, it's not there. Um, sometimes the data you need to inform your approach is in silos, it's disconnected, they're hard to access. And then even sometimes when we know what works, it's really hard to scale that. So maybe it works for one organization or in one community, but how do you take that statewide or countywide? There are also just really serious talent and resource gaps. Um, people are underfunded, whether it's government agencies, community-based organizations, you don't have the operating staff to hire people who specialize in data and research or who can lead your efforts or your partnerships with academic researchers. It's also really challenging to manage complex research projects. You have your work maybe as a social worker or community health worker, or you're running your unit in your agency, you don't have time to spend working with a researcher, implementing a research design. It really needs to be part of the funding. And there are, of course, budget constraints to do that. There are also barriers, though, that speak more to our culture and our incentives. Um, so on the government side, sometimes the definition of success is really limiting. They want to know a short-term outlook. So they might be asking, how many people did I serve and not, is my program effective for those people? Um, there also is a trust deficit. It's There is a long history that has broken down trust between community partners and researchers or between government agencies and researchers, and we really need to rebuild that trust and partnership. There can even be legal barriers that you need to overcome. Maybe you want to share your data with a researcher, but you're not certain whether you're going to violate a privacy law, and so um, it just becomes really challenging to make that decision. And then, of course, leadership turnover can occur. You might have a research agenda you're working on for someone, they leave office, the new person comes in, and their priorities have changed. And then finally, there are our academic culture and incentives that get in our way as well. So everyone's familiar with the publisher parish, especially for people earlier in their career. They really need to be focused on questions that are going to be published in academic journals. They're in conversations with themselves trying to create general knowledge, but maybe those questions aren't the things that are timely or actionable, like we discussed on the prior slide. Research can be really slow and it has rigid funding that doesn't really allow for the staff time um, to really spend with your community partners or your government partners um, in a more collaborative way. Uh, researchers sometimes have huge subject matter expertise in their scientific field, but maybe lack subject matter expertise um, about their community, their community-based organizations, or the programs that they're studying. And then finally, the style of communication in academia can be a barrier as well. And of course, that we're going to talk more about that today. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on what problems we're trying to solve so that we think more critically about how we design our research, because we really need to be overcoming some of these barriers 
um, to have impact. So the California Policy Lab model is designed to overcome some of these barriers. First of all, we operate a data infrastructure at UCLA that's meant to make research, um, excuse me, data for research more accessible. So we have over 100 data sharing agreements where we're hosting government data. Um, it's all anonymized. There's a lot of compliance around privacy. Um, and we do this at the request of public agencies. So we're par in partnership with them um, to try to break down barriers so that more people can generate the evidence that we need. Uh, we tend to have more flexible funding that allows for staff time to spend time in partnerships. Of course, we're doing rigorous research, trying to examine policies and programs and produce that evidence. Um, we spend a lot of time on communication. We really see it as a crucial part of the research process, not an afterthought that comes at the end, or hopefully we don't. Um, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today, the power of communication. Um, and then finally, and most centrally, all of our work is organized around partnerships. So we work with our partners from day one when we're developing the concepts for the research. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in detail now. So the partnership model is really about working together at all phases of the research process and really being in learning partnerships over time, not working together just on a single project. So we try to have research agendas that last years rather than a project uh, that might last you know, once and then we all go on our way. We work with our government agency partners. We work mostly with government agency partners and of course SERP and others work more with community-based partners or advocacy organizations. But I think these principles apply you wanna be in the room developing the questions together. What are you working on? What are you focused on? Why is it gonna be impactful? We often recommend research methods, but make sure it works for the agency so that it's gonna be something that they can participate in and, and implement in a reasonable way. We're working with them on uh, analyzing and collecting their data. We work with data sharing agreements. Um, and often during an analysis plan, we're previewing those results and getting feedback um, and help interpreting the results and findings. And then finally, we work with them at the end of the project too, to help communicate the impact and make sure that there's that flow through from the research process to the policy impact and implementation. Why do we do this at every stage? It's really building trust. It's making sure your work is relevant to the people who can make decisions with it, that it's fully informed. And our, in our experience, it's also building a lot of capacity and expertise. Of course, you're going to help your government partners or your community partners build more capacity and expertise to do research, but you're also building your own capacity and expertise to understand the things that you're studying. So it's really a mutual capacity building process. I talked a little bit about this, but who could you partner with to try to have policy impact community leaders and organizations? patients, caregivers, parents, family, individuals with lived experience, healthcare, including clinics, public health departments, hospitals, government agencies, advocacy organizations. Of course, if you're gonna work with some of these types of groups, particularly people with lived experience, patients, community leaders, you really need to offer fair payment for their time. Um, this is an issue that SERP is an expert on. I highly recommend you go to their website and look at their training materials and resources on how to do community engaged research um, and or try to reach um, some of their con consultation resources if you're going to do this. There's the how to do that well is way beyond the scope of this of this particular training, but really encourage you to reach out to them. The last point I want to make about this is that um, when you're asking yourselves, how do I do this? Okay, so I wanna move from a research model where I'm asking questions, getting data, doing my work to something that's more in a partnership model. The number one most important thing is that it takes funding for staff time. You really need people on your team who can build those relationships, talk to people, set up meetings, interpret the findings, go back and communicate what happened. It's not something that's easy to do just as a side project. Um, and, and so, really thinking about wanting to do this at a proposal phase and not um, after a project has begun. <clears throat> so I'll just end this section with a couple of specific examples to make this a little bit more concrete for, for folks. The first example of research that has policy impact from our lab was um, focused on homelessness. 
when we started the lab in Los Angeles, the county was really focused on prevention. How can you stop more people from becoming homeless? The challenging thing to do that is to understand who's at risk of homeless if they're not gonna get assistance. So we thought this was a good um, policy area to try predictive analytics. And we worked with the county to build an integrated data set. It's totally anonymized uh, for privacy reasons. So we don't see anyone's individual data. Uh, but we were able to build this data set with, from eight county departments and link it together um, and use it to try to predict who is going to be at highest risk of becoming homeless by entering a street outreach program or a shelter. And we did that research and proved that we could more accurately predict than just random guessing. And the Board of Supervisors approved a pilot. So the LA County Department of Health Services, Housing for Health, um, agency developed what's called the Homelessness Prevention Unit, um, where they have uh, social workers and others who reach out to people on our risk list, and they offer them uh, immediate assistance, you know, with rental payment, utility payment, um, and other types of services, reconnection to health care. Uh, that pilot's been going on for about a year, and 90% of the participants that have been able to retain their housing, uh, we would have predicted at least a third of them would have become homeless in the same period. So while we're still conducting the evaluation, there are some early promising results. But this is the process in a nutshell where you worked, you know, collaboratively with your partner on the questions that are most impactful for them. And then you really follow them through multiple stages of the process. Um, briefly, this is just one other example where the California Policy Lab um, was working with the California Department of Social Services during the pandemic. The pandemic stimulus payments that were meant to help households weather all of the financial troubles um, were administered by the federal government through tax filing. That's the fastest way the federal government can get money out to individual households. But of course, if you don't file taxes because your income is not high enough, you're not going to get the stimulus payment. So they were really worried about uh, very low income families, very vulnerable families getting left out of the stimulus. So the lab linked social service records with tax data to see who was claiming public benefits, who are non-filers, and then sent them over 400,000 households, sent them messages directly encouraging them to claim their stimulus payments. Um, and our evaluation estimated that um, somewhere between 2.4 million and 13 million extra dollars made its way to California to vulnerable families. So I'm gonna shift gears now away from our model and designing research for impact and into our policy brief training. So we're gonna talk in our model about our communications function. Why is communication so important? Why do we see it as an integral phase of the research process? You know, if someone doesn't understand your research or findings and doesn't know about them, they can't do anything with them. So you could spend years on, a, on the most brilliantly designed research have the greatest insights. And then if you can't communicate them to the people who need to hear about it, it's as if it didn't happen. Um, communication can also reframe an issue. It can create urgency um, and focus on a problem that maybe you think your elected officials or others are not focused enough on. And it can also build your credibility. So with that, we're gonna start our policy brief 101 training. What is a policy brief? So this is a, a great question to start with. I discovered that uh, when we were developing this training, everyone was bringing a slightly different definition of policy brief. Um, so let me tell you what we think it is. It could be many, many other things beyond this that are beyond the scope of um, the training. But for, for us, for today, we're really talking about maybe a short executive summary of a longer report. It could be a very short paper, like generally no more than two to eight pages long. Um, it could be a one page fact sheet summarizing your key findings. Um, it doesn't need to replace a longer report. So if you're writing, let's say a longer um, memo to your board, but you really wanna focus in on a couple of issues, you could maybe have a shorter version that accompanies it. Or if you're writing a big working paper for an academic journal, you can write that thing, but also have a three-page policy brief journal. It's really anything that's written for a general audience that's intended to have impact, meaning it's not written for a scientific or expert audience. 
Why would you want to write a policy brief? Um, some of the reasons because you want policies or programs to change, to shorten something so that a busy person will read it. You want to simplify something for a non-scientific audience. You want to take the important parts out of something that is long and detailed. Um, in other words, writing a policy brief is really an act of translation. You're taking the language and audience um, from one area and translating it into the language and audience of a policymaker. And to translate anything effectively, you need to know both audiences and languages. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the academic audience versus the policy audience. Okay, so who, who is your target audience? You want to change the way um, your city council member operates, your city policies, your state policies, your federal policies, who are you really trying to reach? So your audience for a policy brief, it's usually someone who's really smart. They're very busy. They're probably not familiar with your research area, but they're very likely to be respectful of your expertise. And they care about your findings, but they care more about why they matter. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what we mean by busy. Um, many of these people who are in executive positions in the government work really long hours, you know, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. They could have anywhere from 15 to 20 meetings a day. Every meeting is on a different topic. Usually they're in the room because someone needs them to make a decision. So you get decision exhaustion throughout the day. Internal government policy briefs where they are communicating with each other tend to be no more than one to two pages long. Um, and I've worked in administrations where everything had to be a page or shorter. You literally couldn't put it in the briefing book if it was longer than a page. Um, and internal government briefs tend to be have a bottom line at the top where everything you need to know is in like a sentence. And then it has visual cues for the issues or, or the argument you're trying to make. What's the key concept here? Why am I talking so much about your audience? All of the advice we're gonna give you today about structuring your policy brief is designed to reduce the mental effort in understanding why your research matters so that more people learn from it. When I'm in rooms that are a mix between policymakers and researchers, I can tell you that the thing the policymaker is thinking in the back of your head when you're talking is get to the point. They, they trust you, they don't need to know everything that you did and why you did it. They just wanna know what should I do? What's important here? What's the key takeaway? So let's talk about how to structure a policy brief. So I mentioned that there are these, this is translation happening. So this is a, probably a familiar outline to those of you on the call who are faculty or postdocs or graduate students. This is the basic outline of academic writing. You have to provide your motivation. Why are you asking the question? Why is it important or interesting? Why is it gonna change your field or understanding? And then you really have to talk about your data and methods before you get to your findings. You've got to convince your peers that you know what you're talking about, that you've got interesting and rigorous data, and that you chose the methods that are rigorous and um, scientific. So you're really building your credibility. Then you get to your findings. And an academic writer, if you flip that, if you say your findings up front, your colleagues are going to say, what? Why should I trust this? I know nothing about the data they used or the methods that they used. And then usually academic writing has, has discussion as well, of course. So what does it look like for a policy brief? It's just the findings. It's just the findings and the implications. So what did you learn and why does it matter? In academic writing, you have to convince the reader that your methods merit the result. In policy brief writing, you have to convince the reader that the results merit their attention. Of course, it's not practical to have an outline that's just pure findings with no context or introduction or title, right? So how do you take this piece of advice that your policy brief is largely going to be your findings and actually create an outline? So this is a bit of a longer version where you have a summary. Usually the first half of the first page, you need to cover your questions, a minimal amount of policy background to provide context, and summarize all of your key findings everything in the first half of the first page. Then you can have a longer discussion of your findings. It's typically a good idea to organize them in response to your questions. You're providing enough data and methods to provide context. 
You want your headlines to be visually trackable. Um, and then you can have recommendations or implications. Some authors prefer not to actually make recommendations, which is fine. You can leave that off. There are many, many ways to structure this. And what I'm trying to do today is just provide you a basic outline that you can use, that you can test this out and see if it works for you. Sometimes issues or programs, you know, require a bit of a different structure. And I'm gonna, we're gonna go through a lot next um, about how to, how to actually implement this. The key concept here though is punchline up front. I've gotten the question, well, if I tell everything in the first half of the first page, aren't I disincentivizing per the person from reading the rest of the paper? Aren't they just gonna stop reading after the first page? I can't emphasize enough, a busy person is only gonna read the first page no matter what you say on it. And you want the person who only has the time to read the first half of the first page to understand what you're saying and why it matters. There will be some other readers who wanna read the whole thing. They may even click through to a technical appendix where you provide all the data and methods, but you want everyone who opens your brief to understand why it's important in the first page. So I am actually gonna stop sharing here briefly just to show you um, visually an example of a policy brief before we go into outlining. So this is a policy brief that I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Uh, we published this in March 2022 um, to discuss who benefits from student loan payment pause. So um, as you might recall, during the pandemic, the federal government paused payment of student loans to try to reduce the debt burden on federal student loan borrowers. And there were lots of policy questions. Who did it help? What's going to happen when it ends? So this brief discusses those issues. Um, and I just want you to see something here visually before I go through the outline um, that we're using sort of font colors to highlight for you um, where to focus. So this is this executive summary that I talked about, first half of the first page. Every finding in the report is included in these initial um, three paragraphs. And then you're going to have these orange headers that create a visual map for the key points that you're trying to make. It doesn't mean that there isn't data and charts in here, there is, but if someone wanted to visually scan the report and see what we're gonna discuss, they can do that through the text in the headers. So I'm gonna go back to sharing the, um, one second, the presentation. Nope, that didn't do it. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Okay, so this is the actual outline of the policy brief that I was just showing you. So there's a title, who benefits from the student loan payment pause and what will happen when it ends. There's this executive summary. Um, and one thing that's really interesting about this is that this policy brief uses the real estate of the title to show the question, um, which is totally something you can do for a policy brief. So who benefits from the student loan payment pause and what will happen when it ends? It's very easy to understand from the title, the two questions that this brief is trying to answer. The executive summary, as I mentioned, has all five key findings in it. And then you have these um, orange headers in the brief, the student loan payment pause. So there's one to two paragraphs of context about what the program did. There's a section on who's impacted. It has a one paragraph on methods, but it's mostly findings and policy description. And then each of the remaining headers are your findings. So the whole brief is organized around findings. How has it impacted borrowers? What happens when it ends? 7.8 million borrowers at high risk missing payments, 13.5 million, they're at low risk of missing payments. We, they couldn't classify 6.8 million borrowers. Then there's a very brief conclusion that verbatim states the findings. Um, so it's very easy in this structure to understand what they were trying to learn and what they did learn and why it matters. So interestingly, when uh, the lab put this out and did a press release and sent this out, the media um, largely was able to pick out 
what matter, depending on the outlet, they may have focused on different things, but this is just a sample of the media headlines coming out of this policy brief. So loosened chokehold on borrowers, one outlet focused on the 7.8 million student loan borrowers, but they could pick these headlines from the headlines of the sections of the policy brief or from the first half of the first page. So at this point, what we're going to do is an editing exercise of the policy brief that we sent around um, before the training. And um, before I actually get into the outline and architecture of this policy brief, I want you all to have a chance to hear about this incredible program. I really loved working on this part of the training and getting to know more about this medical legal community partnership program, but I'm going to briefly turn it over to Jessica Hara to talk about this project. Thanks, Janie, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Hara, and I'm a data analyst at the UCLA CTSI and the LA County DHS. Now we're going to go over the MLCP evaluation I co-led, which was also sent out um, to the workshop entities a few days ago. This evaluation was a partnership between the county health system, the legal partners, and UCLA as the data evaluation team. And to give a background on MLCP, in 2018, the LA County Department of Health Services the County Safety Net Health System was able to provide additional social services due to NUNU Medicaid waiver to support the care of its patients. One of these social service programs included MLCP, a novel legal aid program providing free legal help to low-income patients in county health clinics. This program placed lawyers in primary care clinics to address patients' legal needs. However, the problem was that in 2021, the funding was ending and the hope was that the program impact would spur sustainable county funding. In terms of policy, there were three questions we needed to address to prove the value of MLCP services. Were there health and social impacts of the program on the patients? Does MLCP reduce medical costs? And lastly, does MLCP provide value to the county health system, Medicaid, or other funders? Now that I've given a brief overview of the Medical Legal Community Partnership Program and the goals of our evaluation, I'd like to pass it back over to Janie to discuss um, how to modify and improve our impact report into a policy brief. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, this is just really an incredible program to hear about that the um, LA County Health System was able to place enough legal aid lawyers in clinics in medical settings to resolve 9,000 cases and to do it during the pandemic. It was really inspiring. Um, and I also just want to say a huge thank you to Jessica and anyone else on the team who contributed to this policy brief because I'm about to <laughs> I'm about to edit it live in front of a lot of people. Um, and it's so generous of you to do that. I could have easily picked any number of CPL publications that need to be edited, but I thought um, your audience might enjoy a topic that they might be more familiar with. So, Thank you for your grace, and um, we really appreciate you allowing us to look at this um, for purposes of, of learning together. All right, so let's take a look at the, this is the outline of the brief that was shared with you in advance of the training. <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you guys to absorb all this information. I just, I'm going to walk you through um, what's important here. So the first page has key takeaways at the top. So that seems good, right? We talked about making sure your key findings are at the top of your first page. Then there's a program overview and goals. So you, of course, you need to know what you're studying. Legal services for health. There's a section called legal services for health next, and it talks about some of the common legal issues that these um, legal aid lawyers were solving in these clinics. There's a section on building capacity through, through training. So there's often these... Um, benefits that you get from implementing programs like that, where you have to train staff, you know, doctors, nurses, whoever is working in these settings to um, spot legal issues or work with a new partner. Then there's a section on impact and outcomes. So this is where the main research findings are. Um, then there's a section on how the program changed during the pandemic. There was an increase in demand for legal services, but also a shift in type of legal services towards housing and income cases. Then there's a section on lessons learned, strengths and challenges, um, some recommendations, acknowledgements, and then um, statistical methods. And, and one thing I really wanna call out about this policy brief, I love that the statistical methods are like in a call out box at the end. I think it's a different color. Um, that's awesome. You just wanna put it there for credibility and for people who wanna know it. 
um, but it's not really distracting from the policy brief content. Um, another strategy we do for statistical methods is just a link to what's called a technical appendix. So you can just literally put a link in and then there's a landing page on your website with a detailed um, stats section. Danny, there was a quick request to slow down just a, a touch. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I was telling people before I started that sometimes I speak too quickly. So um, I will actually, why don't, because that was a big slide. Why don't I just pause there for a second um, and let you all sort of take this in for a second and then I'll walk through it again um, for a couple of slides. So don't worry, it's not going away, but I'll, let me just pause here for about 30 seconds so you guys can read this. Thanks, Sean. All right, so everyone kind of have a lay of the land, the sections of this report. So on the next slide, I want to remind you of that policy brief outline and what the audience might be looking for here. They probably want to know, they're not familiar with the medical legal community partnership at all. They don't know anything about it. They want to know probably what were your questions? What were you trying to answer with the project? Um, they're probably going to want to know what it is. So you need to have some policy or program background in your brief. They definitely want to know your findings. So what was I trying to learn and what did I learn? Um, and then a policymaker especially is going to want to know, okay, what do I do with this? What's your recommendation? Should this program continue? Should we fund it? Should we change it? You know, they're going to want to know, okay, what's the point here? So I've color coded these because I'm going to now show the outline again where I think these things are in the current outline. So again, we're looking for orange research questions, blue um, program background, yellow research findings, green recommendations. Okay, so you can see here that you've got um, kind of a mix of colors here. So you're going to have findings at the top, like we said. Um, some program, three sections of program description. Then you've got some findings. Um, then it reverts back to program description because there was this change in the program design during the pandemic. Uh, lessons learned, strengths and challenges has some findings in it as well. Um, and then your recommendations. So I'm just going to give um, everyone a minute to kind of look at this and, and look at the flow. Okay, so what is challenging about this outline and the way it's set up? Um, for a policy audience. There are a couple of things. You actually need to look in three places to understand the findings. And that's partly because the key findings in this are not actually all the findings. It's a subset of findings. So when you read the brief, the key takeaways at the top are just a couple of the findings, and then you have to look in a couple of other places. So um, your reader's got to do a little bit of work to figure out what are what are all the things that you learned um, in this evaluation. Similarly, the program description is in a few different places. It kind of got broken up by that impact session. I'll just go back a slide for a second, right? So if you're looking at these blue sections, your program descriptions in a couple of places, you're gonna have to skip around and figure out what was the program and what was it during the pandemic. Um, interestingly, there weren't really explicit research questions that provided a, a roadmap for your reader, right? So in policy briefs, research questions can be a really effective call and answer. Um, and so they provide an organizing concept so that your findings uh, make more sense because they're responsive to, to questions. I want to pause here and also say that when you're writing a policy brief, you shouldn't 
think of your questions necessarily as um, set in stone empirical research questions that you had to set years ago before you started. It's okay to reframe your questions to help you organize your findings. Um, and we do this a lot, you know, so we'll talk a little bit about the process of how you find your, your findings. But um, if you really think you have like three really important messages, you might frame your questions um, in response to that. So it can kind of work in, in reverse. Again, the point of a policy brief is to tell a policymaker what you found and why it matters. It's not a conversation with peers. Um, and then finally, one thing that was challenging about uh, this outline is that it's a bit unclear whether all the recommendations were in the recommendations section, because you have something called lessons learned and you have something called recommendations. So when I, the first time I scanned it, I was like, wait, am I looking for the implications in both sections or just one? Um, and so really making sure your headers are clear um, and that you know, okay, this is the section. If I just read this section, I'm gonna get all the recommendations and I'm not gonna have to read um, multiple sections. So here's just, I'm gonna give you guys two suggestions for how this particular brief might be reorganized um, to better communicate findings to a policymaker. I'm sure there would be more, um, but of course, we always recommend you have a summary at the top. What was your question? So Jessica um, described those three policy questions. So I think putting those up front, um, describing the program, it could be very short because you'll have real estate later to talk in more detail. And then every every key finding in the first half of the first page, everything you want your reader to know. Then um, you could restate your questions if you need to, um, unless they're really clear from your summary. And then for this particular program, there's just so much rich information about the program design and the training and the changes during the pandemic. You could have a longer section here about your program. Um, and then you want to have your findings in one place. Some examples here, they trained over 6,000 clinical staff. It's amazing. Um, they resolved 9,000 legal cases. There was an average recovery of $4,000 for anyone in a financial case. Um, they did not find that the healthcare outcomes were significant. Um, so that's something that we'll talk about in a minute when we get to key findings. Um, but you kind of want to have your main points here and then put all your policy recommendations in one section at the end. And then I think sticking with the strategy for statistical methods is great. One thing that I didn't, um, I'm just realizing I didn't make totally visible in this outline is that this brief did a really nice job of calling out an example, an anonymized client example. That can be a really great way to communicate in a policy brief, just to humanize all your findings. And, and often people retain information when there's a specific example of the point that you're trying to make. So we really encourage you all to do that. Um, here's just an alternative for how you could reframe this brief. So again, you want that summary, questions, program description, key findings, first half of your first page. Then you could have your questions um, if you need to. And then the twist here is that you could organize the whole brief by findings. Everything else that comes after this is a header of a thing that you want the person to know. And then you embed all of that program description underneath the relevant findings. So an example might be a header, um, the medical legal community partnership successfully resolved 9,000 legal cases. That's your header. And then underneath, you can describe the types of services that they provided, the case lengths, how long it took them to resolve, um, you know, so some of the detail that would have been in your program description, um, you can embed under a finding and then have policy recommendations. So I think either way in this case would be fine. Just to go back a second, this version has a long program description section. This section is organized around findings and your program description is underneath your findings. Um, and so uh, the last thing that I want to say here, just as a takeaway, the key concept, if you take nothing else from this section, make sure you have your punchline up front. If you can get your first half of your first page to summarize your questions, provide enough contacts and cover all your key findings, you can organize the rest um, in a variety uh, of different ways. There's no exact one way to do it. 
The handout that we'll provide to you at the end of the training has links to a lot of examples. So if you're in the process of writing something now, maybe one of those examples will track um, to your project. Um, and, and you can use one of those if this outline isn't, um, isn't resonating. Okay, so key findings. Um, I said many times in the last section that you're gonna organize your brief around your findings. So what are your key findings and how do you find them? Because that seems to be important, right? You're gonna have to know what they are in order to organize your your outline. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that. Um, and this is something that will be um, in the handout verbatim. When you're working in your team, um, your maybe your researchers, your community partners, um, whoever is working on this project together, you want to be asking what is the most important things that we're learning and why should someone pay attention? Just ask yourselves that. And the answer to these questions is gonna change over time. You're gonna refine your thinking on this. This is not sort of an automatic exercise. So we're gonna talk a little bit about which of the findings for the medical legal partnership might be key findings. Um, so Jessica Hara read a moment ago that these were the three motivating questions for this project. Were there health and social impacts of the program on the patients? Does the um, partnership reduce medical costs? Does it provide value to the county health system, Medicaid, or other funders? So these are sort of three motivating questions. Um, and these are some of the findings from the brief. Number of clinical staff trained, over 6,300. That's really incredible, by the way. Anyone on the call who worked on this program, you know, kudos to you. Number of legal cases completed over 9,000. The outcome of legal cases, like how many evictions were avoided, for example. The average amount of money re recovered by clients in financial cases is $4,000 for, not all clients had financial cases, obviously, but for those who did, the average amount recovered is 4,000, which is incredible. Um, there was a finding on the average length of cases. Uh, they were, The average length was 70 days, but the majority of them took fewer than than three hours. So there must have been some outlier cases that were really, really long. Uh, we had a finding that there was changes in legal needs during the pandemic. They increased, but also shifted towards income and housing cases. Um, and then interestingly, given the time period for measuring outcomes, the team did not see a statistically significant reduction in inpatient stays. Um, and they weren't able to detect changes to primary care specialty care and emergency department visits. Um, and just to remind you, I think they were comparing people, um, patients in the partnership to patients who weren't, right? So they were trying to see if resolving legal issues might have a positive impact on healthcare. Um, so that was one of the things that they wanted to find out. So um, I've numbered these because now we're gonna do another exercise. So, um, and I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to think about that, but just pause and remind yourselves in the blue what, what the team is trying to learn, and then these eight things that they learned. And what you can do in the Zoom chat is just pick some numbers. So you might write, you know, I think it's one, three, and eight, or I think it's one, two, three, four. Um, but just pause a moment, read the questions, read the findings, and try to pick out what you think um, are the really important ones that you would want to emphasize for a policymaker, knowing that these are the questions going in. So I'm just going to mute myself for a minute and give you guys a chance to read this.
All right. I love this participation. Um, I can't do any kind of fancy like calculation or vote thing. Maybe we could have figured that out in advance. But um, one trend I noticed in the responses in the chat is that very few people picked both seven and eight. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that in, in the next slide. But of course, as someone who helped develop the training, I had a lot of time to think about what I would select as the key findings, unlike all of you who had a minute. But let me just show you what, um, what I thought were the key findings here, which is uh, basically, um, oh, I just realized I messed up the numbers, but um, I believe it's one, two, uh, or one, two, three, and seven, eight. So one, two, three, seven, eight. Sorry, I shouldn't have um, messed with the numbers. <laughs> that can go on the survey as a training improvement. Um, but let me talk a little bit about what, why I picked what I did. So number of clinical staff trained for a policymaker, this is just a really interesting um, uh, point about how you're providing value to the county health system. Um, and then number and type of legal cases completed <clears throat> over 9,000. That's just like speaks to the sheer work um, of the of the partnership. And it's really answering this question, are there social impacts of the program on, on patients? Then I picked the outcomes of those legal cases. So you don't wanna just provide legal services, you want to have positive impact on, on people's lives. Um, and then the old seven, eight, these two things I think are actually really important. These reduction in inpatient stays not being statistically significant and that there were no detectable changes to primary care. Because these are the question, these are the findings that are really answering this question. Does it reduce medical costs and does it provide value to Medicaid or other funders? Um, and, and I wanted to make a point here. It doesn't necessarily surprise me that that most people on the chat did not pick both seven and eight. So this is the original list. Most people didn't pick seven and eight, or at least that I saw um, when I was monitoring the chat. And one instinct that I think report authors can have is that when you have findings that are not slam dunk, you sort of have like a, hmm, what did we find there? You know, we didn't really see the impact that we wanted to see or that we thought we might see. There can be an instinct to de-emphasize them, even if they are the most important direct response to your questions. Um, and I would really encourage you for a policy brief not to do that. Put them front and center. It's fine. Um, it's for transparency. This is the question you were trying to answer. We frequently have impacts um, that are not detectable in our work. Um, and the reason why it's so important is that a policymaker needs to know that Medicaid may not be the uh, sustainable source of funding for this program, right? They need to know that that happened. Um, often you can have a finding like this because you just didn't have enough time to measure it. Um, it's, it takes a really long time to see an impact on health um, or healthcare utilization. And so you can frame your finding that we didn't have time to measure impacts, you know, or in the time period we have, we didn't see um, a significant reduction. But you gotta answer the question um, and, and make sure it's, it's visible to your reader. So the five that I picked, and by the way, you know, there's no right answer here. Um, you could pick other ones. It's really about what you want to communicate. But um, for, for us, when we tried to summarize, what's the story you're telling? If these are your key findings, what's the story that you're telling your, your reader of, of your policy brief? Um, and I think the story here is that this program helped a lot of low income patients in the safety net meet their legal needs. There's no question. It was very effective at doing that. Um, but the team wasn't able to measure how meeting legal needs affects health outcomes, like health utilization and medical costs within the time frame of the analysis. So you're telling your elected official, wow, we did so much work. It really, we really got this thing to function. We implemented it. It helped thousands of people. Um, but we couldn't see the healthcare outcomes that we thought we were uh, going to see. So I'll just tell you very genuinely, when I read this brief and started working with the team um, who worked on it on this policy brief training, I couldn't take my policymaker hat off. <laughs> and I'll tell you that, that I kept thinking like, wow, you know, like how, how could, you know, how could an elected official 
um, or the system support this amazing program. So I wanted to share with you how I responded um, to the policy brief when we sort of organized the findings. So this, this is the same summary that you saw on the last slide. And, and my response was, and maybe another policymaker would feel this way, this is really important. This is a really important service to support low-income patients and their social needs. But we may need to find other strategic funding pathways if the county health system can't fund it. If this isn't going to be reimbursable through Medicaid, there's got to be another funding mechanism. And what I would want to know is, can you measure impacts on housing stability and income? So if the health impacts are harder or longer um, to detect, maybe you can see more immediate effects on these patients, housing stability, um, avoiding homelessness, increasing their income, increasing their benefits. The reason why that's important is that funding that is designed to do those things might actually be a funding source for this program. So this is why it's really important um, to include your findings, even if they're not slam dunk impacts. Uh, include the findings that answer your questions because a good policymaker is going to understand what they mean, what to do with them, and they're going to move on. And if they want, they think the program is valuable, um, they're going to start to think creatively um, about how to sustain it. Okay, so just to wrap this section, identifying your key findings, you want as your team to work together. What, are, what were your questions? What's the most important thing we learned? Why should someone pay attention? Um, and in terms of the process for doing this, um, I can't emphasize enough that this is something you need to do continuously. Your pre-findings, go to feedback sessions, solicit input from um, all of the partners that you're working with on a project, get external reviewers to weigh in. Often what we're doing because of our partnership model is previewing the results with our government partners. Like, what does this mean to you? What do you think? What's important about it? Um, and really relying on their expertise to help sharpen our thinking about what to highlight. Um, uh, so, so yeah, build in, build in time to do this in your research process. Okay, so we're gonna shift into language and jargon. Um, so let's revisit our audience. You're, you know, let's say you're outside your apartment building, working on your car, or maybe you're in your yard and you're talking to your neighbor and they say, how's work going? And you want to be able to talk about this research project that you're collaborating on. You've got to be able to tell that person what you're doing um, in language that they can understand. Um, so I always try to keep, for me, it's my my mom. Um, I always try to keep her in my mind's eye. Like if I'm trying to explain something that I'm working on to her, does she understand it? Whoever is in your mental image, it's your neighbor or someone. Um, it's going to be this person who's not a subject matter expert, but who's smart and curious and wants to know what you're doing. What kind of language do we want to use? We want to target technically correct nomenclature that is simultaneously comprehensible to lay people. Try to avoid too many caveats. Usually one will suffice. Your sentences should be really short, like one to two lines, and your word should be short, like one to three syllables. In other words, be accurate, but simple. Avoid too many caveats. Usually one suffices. You wanna do this editing process throughout all of your writing. Be accurate, but simple. Okay, so now I'm going to um, air some dirty laundry from the California Policy Lab and share some jargon that has made its way into our policy briefs um, so that you get a flavor for uh, what it looks like to try to take it out. Uh, we all speak in our own worlds, in our own cultures, whether you're in a nonprofit or a research space, you get used to saying the same things over and over again. It's really hard to know, actually, that you're speaking in jargon. It drives my husband nuts. Um, and, you know, when I, he says it's like speaking in alphabet soup. Um, so, okay. One phrase I've seen is this phrase, exploit the data. Um, and someone might be thinking, like, why are you harming the data? You can just say, use the data. Use the data is much easier to understand. Another one that we've seen um, in our labor work is like a stock of claimants. So, so they're trying to refer to a group of people who have claimed unemployment insurance benefits. I think you could just say a group of claimants or a group of people who claimed uh, benefits. Third example, um, I've seen the phrase in our work, an unemployment spell. 
uh, which is a sort of like a labor economics term. Um, if you use that, someone might think that like a fairy godmother is making magic spells um, in your work. So just say period of unemployment, it's a lot easier uh, to understand. Okay, so we're just going to play a little bit of, uh, of a game here, and I'm going to put a, jar a word of um, jargon up um, on the screen and then just try to put a plain English version of it right into the chat. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to start with an easy word. What's an alternative for the word mortality? Yeah, okay, you guys got it, death. Okay, the next one, clinical staff. Oh, good one, healthcare team, doctors, nurses, clinicians providers, hospital staff, great, I love that. Um, I put this one in here actually as an example of like a phrase that people on the call might use all the time and they they don't, you don't recognize this as jargon. I bet some of you who are on this webinar right now are thinking like, that's not jargon, that's plain English. But I will tell you that when um, our team read this brief, because we don't work in the health space, that our communications director was like, what do they mean by clinical staff? Um, who is that? So, so always remind yourself to get external reviewers and get that perspective of what may or may not be jargon. So in this case, doctors and nurses, but you guys have even better ideas in the chat. Health professionals, I really like that, providers. Okay, here's your next one. This is for uh, doctors who might be on the call. Presenting complaint. The person's presenting complaint was X. Okay, we got main problem pain, symptom, reason for visit, concern. Oh yeah, you guys are good at this. Um, I'm, I'm impressed, nice job. Okay, so we had a couple of options here, reason for seeking help or your main symptoms. Okay, this one is for um, any economists on the call. This phrase pops up a lot, income maintenance. Anyone wanna take a stab at this one, income maintenance? Budget, yeah, that's in a good one. Income source, yeah, a lot of, this is actually, um, salary loss is a good one. This is just sort of like steady income. You know, you're trying to promote someone's income maintenance, their steady income. Oh, nice one. Okay, so this is a bit long um, in the interest of time. You can try to summarize it if you want, but um, this is the kind of like, jargony language, like long sentence you can sometimes see. So the investigation is ongoing and it's being jointly conducted by operational units of the FBI and the CIA. Um, it sounds official, but really the, the better way to say this is just the FBI and CIA are still investigating. That's all you're really saying here. Yes, Leah, good one. Um, Mary's got a good one. Yeah, you guys are great. You're really on the ball. Okay, so I believe that that takes me to the end of my section. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sean, to go through data visualization. Um, and Sean, I think we're right on time. So, you know, take your time. Thank you, Jenny. Um... Okay. Um, as Janie said, my name is Sean Coffey. I'm the Communications Director at the California Policy Lab. I'm very excited to talk to you all today about data viz, um, the editing and research release process, and working with the media. Um, I will say that I think data viz, and what I mean by that is just figures, charts, tables, maps, um, can often be a bit of an afterthought in the writing or editing or release process. And I am here to encourage you not to have it be an afterthought, but to really uh, incorporate it into your writing and editing process. Um, and I'll give you three kind of important reasons for doing that. Um, the first is just how our brains work. We process um, visual images much faster than we can process text. So a good uh, figure or chart can really um, help sell your story. Um, and in a policy brief, that's what you're doing. You are selling a story, you are selling your research, and a good database can do that. Um, related to that is just timing. Um, you know, when you're writing a publication, I think we all kind of have this fantasy that 
when people get it, they're going to open it and read it from cover to cover and read every page and really appreciate all the, the work that we did on it. Um, the reality may be a little bit different than that. If you think about, um, even for um, issues that you care about, if I get an email about a new report, even if it's something I care deeply about, I'm probably going to open the report and skim through it. I may spend three or four minutes with it. Um, and the things that I'm going to look at are the executive summary and probably the data viz. And so having good data visualization can get your reader engaged. Um, it can share the story. It can kind of trigger it in their brains so that they can come back to it later. Um, the third reason to focus on data viz is just competition. Um, we are really competing with a lot these days. Um, you are competing with other people who are putting out good research on other important pressing public policy issues. And you're also competing for people's attention. So if you think about the number of text messages, Slack messages, emails, social media sites you visit in a day, um, we are trying to compete with all that to say, hey, look at our research, it's important. Um, so I'm gonna jump into some of the strategy of strategies around data viz. I will say at the beginning that this is much more of an overview. Um, our handout has um, resources to get more into this um, if you are interested. So first, uh, three things to think about with um, charts. Um, the first thing, and this is for charts and tables, um, is really know your purpose. Um, why are you including this figure? Are you doing it because you got to the end and you needed to break up space? Um, if that's the case, that may not be a good reason to include the figure. Um, you really want to think through what is the one sentence takeaway that I want my reader to have from this figure and how do I get them there? Um, another thing to think about is what we call the data to ink ratio. As you can see from the two figures at the top, um, the one on the left has a lot of ink and not a lot of data. The one on the right, um, we've gotten rid of what we call chart junk. So in this case, that's the grid lines, it's the extra color in the background. Um, this is easier on your reader. And just as a reminder, our brains can hold about four pieces of visual information at any one given time. So the more you can take out of your figures that's not absolutely necessary, the better and the easier you're making it on the reader. Um, I do not get a commission for this, but I am gonna really um, plug checking out Data Wrapper. It's a free website. We use it at the California Policy Lab. It's pretty easy to use, it's intuitive. You can upload your Excel sheets or Google Sheets, or even paste data into it, and it will help you select great looking charts, maps, and tables. Um, you can then embed those on your website. Other people can embed them. Um, if you get lucky, maybe a reporter will embed your figure or table onto their article on their website. Um, it's mobile responsive, so if somebody is looking at your figure on their phone, it will adapt to that. Um, and it is free. Um, there is, yes, there are paid versions of it um, that will like take off their label at the bottom of the picture, but we've had great luck with the free version. Um, we've been using it for several years. Um, the last thing I'll mention about Data Wrapper is that it also has accessibility features built in. Um, I know in the UC system, we are increasingly focused on um, how to make sure our publications and our websites and our videos are accessible. And so having that built in is super helpful. So I'm gonna share an example of a terrible um, figure. This is um, intentionally a little bit bad, but feel free to in the chat kind of comment on some of the things that you would change about this figure. Um, this is a figure, we did not put this in a report, this is an example, but this is a report um, that my colleagues had done about uh, unemployment benefits in November of 2020. And at the time, um, Congress and the president were deciding whether or not to extend some of the pandemic unemployment benefits. Um, and so this report was looking at if they did not extend those, um, what might happen? So this is the, um, chart done in Excel with not great data viz um, practices. And then here is the same chart, but we um, put into Excel or put into data wrapper, I'm sorry, and did use some of the good data viz. So um, as you can see, it's very clear to the reader the point that we want them to take from this figure, which is on the day after Christmas, unless Congress and the president do something, close to 600,000 Californians are going to lose their unemployment benefits. 
Um, and as you will note down at the bottom of the figure, um, those blue lines are all um, things that you could click on if you had this figure embedded on your website. Um, so people could get the data. That's a, a best practice for accessibility. Um, they can get the data and then have their screen reader read it to them. They can embed this chart on their uh, website um, or they could download the image. Um, I'm gonna shift on to tables. Um, some of the same principles apply, um, really trying to simplify it where possible. You also wanna think about alignment just to make it easier on your reader. Um, so right align your cells and your numbers, left align text and headings. Um, if there is a big outlier that you want somebody to notice, um, you, you feel free to kind of highlight that for them. So in this case, they do it in red. Um, and the same idea of reducing junk. Um, if all of the chart is percents, you can just pull that out of every cell and put it in one of the headers. Um, I highly recommend the article at the bottom. Um, and he has a website that's also very helpful as you're kind of starting to dip your toes into improving your data visualization. Um, so again, here is a uh, example table that's not great. Um, this is from a report that my colleagues did looking at the, the take-up gap for the state earned income tax credit. Um, one thing I'll also point out to you is that the rows and columns are different size. Um, that's a bit of a no-no if you can avoid it because our brains are automatically inferring something, even if um, me as the table designer didn't want the reader to think anything, if it's different size, our brain actually processes it and may infer a relationship that's there, um, even if it's not a real relationship. So moving on to the um, improved version of this, um, this is in Data Wrapper. Um, got rid of some of the extra lines and we highlighted the bottom row just to really emphasize what we want the reader to take away. In this case, it's that $75 million worth of the state earned income tax credit went unclaimed in 2017. Um, one thing you'll note is the rows are not all consistently sized. Um, I do some of the design work on our reports. I know it's not always possible to do it, but it is something to look out for to try and have your rows and columns consistently sized when possible. Um, I think another person might look at this table and say, actually, the outlier you want to highlight is the fact that of people who claim the federally ITC but not the state, 92% of them um, had used an in-person paid tax repair. So that might be another interesting outlier to highlight. Um, as Janie mentioned at the California Policy Lab, we tend to be more focused on quantitative research. Um, so I'm sharing a couple of examples of how to present qualitative data, and we have more in the handout. Um, but uh, I think personally that qualitative um, research can be incredibly powerful, as we've talked about um, opening a report with a story from a real person about how a program or policy is impacting them. I think is a great way to get your reader interested. It's also good for um, elected officials to see how it's impacting um, their constituents. All right, so in terms of the policy brief writing process and making time, um, during my time at the California Policy Lab, I've been here about four years, I've managed the release for probably close to 60 publications. Um, one common theme that I think comes up in most of the reports is that there will be a little hiccups in the process and those little hiccups can cost you time. So if you are the main person in charge of um, the report release process, building in a little extra time can be super helpful, um, especially if you're up against a hard deadline like a grant report or a contract. Um, the types of hiccups that you might encounter could be um, your colleague is slow in giving edits back, um, you may uncover a data issue during your code review, um, or you may have a colleague or partner who um, gives you feedback that you weren't expecting, but you need to address and incorporate. So those are all things to kind of build into your timeline. Um, in terms of process and making time, um, just to reemphasize, this very much is an iterative process. So. Um, you will do a draft and then you're going to change it and then it's going to change again and then it's going to change again. It's really quite a process to take out to figure out what is the most important things that we want to keep in the policy brief. I think at the 
this is also a time that's really important at the beginning before you start writing to communicate clearly with everybody on the team what the goal is for the publication. Um, if the audience is policymakers, then perhaps a 40 or 50 page policy report is not the answer, but maybe a policy brief is, or maybe you do write the longer report because it's important to, and you include a shorter version of that that's three to five pages that only includes um, the key findings. Um, in terms of editing, um, you know, I think we've all kind of been there where you have emailed a draft of something to a colleague and they send it back to you an hour later with maybe two or three edits and they say, oh, it looks great. You're like, oh, phew, that's great. I don't have a lot of work to do. Um, that is not the kind of editor that you want for a policy brief. You want somebody who is going to take the time to really set aside um, a couple hours and read through it carefully and make suggestions and ask questions and tell you when things don't make sense. Um, I know the it, in my role, I am not working in the data for months and months, and I'm not um, working on the research project, so I'm kind of a fresh set of eyes. I can come in and say, hey, this doesn't make sense. Um, in terms of working within a team and the team writing process, um, even if you have one person that's kind of on point for managing that editing process, breaking up some of the tasks, I think, can be really helpful. So. Um, you know, maybe one of the analysts is in charge of making sure that all of the references to the data viz in the text matches um, the figures, um, especially if you have edits to figures or the text later on, you need to reconfirm that all of that fits. Um, another thing I would just say in terms of editing is to think through, if you are asking somebody to do those edits, are they comfortable giving you edits? Um, I know for myself, I had a little bit of a um, a learning curve of getting to a point where I was confident, you know, saying to our faculty director, hey, I, I don't have a PhD, but I don't understand the sentence. If I don't understand it, it's going to be hard for a reporter or a policymaker to understand it. Is there a clear way to say this or is there plainer language that we could use here? Okay, um, moving on to dissemination. Um, oh, how about getting it read? Let's not use that lingo. Um, a couple points here. One thing that we use a fair amount at the policy lab is what I, is an embargo. And what that means is um, once the report is final and totally done, I will reach out to anywhere from 10 to 15 reporters who I think may be interested in the findings. Um, I either know that that's a topic that they cover or I've done some Google research and I know that they've um, written about this issue in the past. Um, I will reach out to them maybe a week ahead of time and say, hey, we have this very exciting report. Here's a key finding from it. Um, I would love to share an embargoed copy of it with you today. Is that possible? If they say yes, I'll respect the embargo, then I'm sending them the report. I'm sending them an embargoed press release that kind of puts our framing on the report and has a quote from one of the colleagues. Um, and the reason we do that, and there's a couple of reasons. Um, first, uh, reporters are very, very busy. They are asked to cover an increasingly amount of um, topics with less and less time and fewer resources. Um, so by giving it to them early, you're giving them time to look at the report, kind of dig into it a little bit. Um, if they are interested, they may need to pitch it to their editor and see if the editor approves it. They may need to conduct interviews. Um, and by sharing it with them ahead of time, you're giving them time to do all of that. Um, so on our next slide, I'm gonna share a little bit about some of the groups that we also think about in a release and ways to reach them. Um, I will say, uh, and this chart is in the handout as well, um, one big thing, one kind of big caution on using embargoes, if you have any sort of sense that the publication is not final final, um, I would probably not share an embargoed copy with reporters ahead of time um, it's not a great position to have to go back to those reporters and say, hey, actually, that wasn't the final copy. Here's the updated version, um, and here's the changes we made, and here's why we made the changes. Um, much better to just not use an embargo if you think it's going to change. Um, in terms of social media, I'm sometimes asked, you know, is it worth the time to do social media? Um, and I would say yes. We typically, when we release a publication, will do a Twitter thread. So that's essentially just um, a, you know, a collection of tweets about the report, about the key findings will include the data viz. Um, and the point there is that you know, somebody may be on, follow us on Twitter, but they may not be on our email list. Um, and this is a great way to get more people interested in it. 
Um, many of our target audiences on Twitter, so media, um, policymakers, other advocates, other researchers. Um, this particular thread was uh, about a policy brief that a colleague did on CalFresh churn. So he essentially looked at um, the number of people that leave um, the CalFresh program in California, that's California's food stamp program, um, every year and they leave um, instead of jumping through the red tape of having to recertify that they're still eligible for the program. Um, so this was a, a report where we reached out to a lot of folks ahead of time to let them know it was coming. Um, and I think that did help with the promotion on the day of the release. Um, and so you can see we have pretty much all of the kind of key target audiences that you would want um, responding to it. There's an elected official talking about it saying, yes, this is a public policy problem. Here's my public policy solution. You have a doctor weighing in and saying, yes, this is a problem that impacts my doc, uh, my patients. Um, you have advocacy groups also weighing in with their policy solutions, uh, funder talk, um, weighing in, and one of our peers as well. So um, yes, it is a, an investment of time to be on social media, to grow your social media audience, but I do think it is worth it. Okay, and then the last part I'm going to talk about is preparing for media interviews. Um, so this is also, I think, a really exciting time because you put in a lot of work to get reporters interested, and when they are interested, this is kind of your moment to shine with your uh, research findings and talk about why this matters. Um, if you are doing something where you think you are going to get media interest, I definitely recommend creating a briefing document where you can talk about okay, what are the three points that I want to convey that I would love um, to be in a segment um, about this research or that I'd love to see in an article tomorrow if they were to write an article about it. Um, so put that up top um, and then think through what are the, some of the questions a reporter may have? What are my answers for that? Um, and I think this is also, it's much easier to decide who is going to be kind of on point for media interviews easier to make those decisions ahead of time as compared to when it's a, a real live question. Um, reporters are often on pretty tight uh, timelines, so it's helpful for you to know, okay, this is who's on point for uh, media interviews today. Um, one other point I will make, similar to doing a job interview, you may have your two or three key points that you want to make sure you say. Um, the reporter may not ask about those. That's okay. You wedge them in anyway. Um, Make sure you get them in there because um, those are those are important. And I will also say, uh, especially with TV and radio, um, you may talk to a reporter from anywhere from five to fifteen to twenty minutes. Their segment may only be two or three minutes, if that, and your quote um, or your where you're talking may only be twenty to thirty seconds. And so you really want to practice your interviews and really work at having good, crisp lines about your research findings and why it matters. Um, I, you know, I have a colleague who is great at media. He's done a lot of media. He was doing an interview earlier this week, and we still did a practice session before the actual one. It gave him time to test out some new answers, see if they worked or not. Um, and I think as a result of doing the practice session, when he sat um, with the real reporter, he was more comfortable. He had practiced his answers. He was ready to go. So it's something I highly recommend, something you, you will not regret doing. Um, and I think with that, we are uh, moving into the Q&A. So thank you all. This was wonderful. Thank you so much, Janie and Sean. There are lots of questions in the audience that we can go through, and I'm just going to shout out one of them. And um, and if you too or Dr. Brown want to answer, feel free. Um, one question was, how do you balance community engagement, including partners throughout the research process? when we're required to apply for grants and contracts with projects that already have research questions in mind. Dr. Brown, do you wanna take that one first? Could you repeat the first part of that question? Sure. How do you balance community engagement and including mm -hmm. partners throughout the research process mm -hmm. when we're required to apply for grants and contracts with projects that already have research questions in our in mind? You know, I think one of the things that we try to do is build partnerships that are long standing. So in a lot of cases, we'll bring our partners to the table when we're thinking about applying for a research grant. Um, and if a grant comes up that's 
pretty has a quick turnaround. Um, we sometimes apologize and say we've got to do this quickly. Can you spend some time with us to help us think it through? So we really try to involve partners um, very early in the process and often before the opportunities come up. Um, and we also try to get their perspective on the questions, because in a lot of cases, we interpret the questions one way and they may interpret it very differently given their lived experience and um, the the topics that they're focused on. So we really try to make sure that we're thinking about the questions together. Thank you for that. Sean and Janie, do you have anything to add? I was actually gonna give the exact same answer that so many of our partnerships are years long. So we're both working with a partner as soon as we know we're writing a grant, but we're also going out and looking for grants that meet our partner's questions. So it's, you can't always find them, but um, I did wanna share though for, cause not everyone maybe is in that situation. And I can think of at least one project that we worked on where we were actually pretty far along in pursuing research questions and discovered later than normal that we needed different perspectives than we normally get. Um, and we took the questions to our own community advisory board. And I, and I think in a situation like that, it's really about your trust and your transparency. You just need to tell people in advance, here's the situation. We're working on these research questions. We have these findings. We really want an opportunity to spend some time with you and get your feedback. They can opt in or opt out um, to the topic or the conversation. But I think it's really about communicating very clearly what you need what the parameters are, what the opportunity is for them, how much you'll pay them. And then people can make an informed choice about whether uh, they want to be involved, even though they may not have been involved in the research uh, design phase originally. I appreciate that. This is a multi-part uh, question, so hold, hold on to your seats. Um, how are policy questions decided? Um, what are some common missteps that researchers make when trying to impact policy? And how do I align my research agenda with policymakers? All really good questions. Yeah, they're they're so good. Dr. Brown, did you want to start? Uh, no, I think that one was directed at you. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first question is, how are policy questions decided? Um, for, from my experience, you know, we're we're pretty focused on certain topics and we follow the policy conversation pretty closely because of our partnerships. So we're just to give you a sense of sort of the frequency, we're in partner meetings at, many times at least once a week. Um, there are a few that it's like maybe monthly or quarterly, but that's less common. So we we really have a sense of how that policy area, or maybe an individual agency or group of agencies evolving. Um, we kind of have a sense, for example, that, wow, Cal AIM is about to have a big impact on LA County, and maybe we need to be thinking proactively about research. Um, but, when, but when we're really translating those policy questions to research questions, it is a process. Sometimes we'll have a partner come to us, and they're really just acting, asking a fact question, and we have to help them turn that into a research question. I don't know if that's a very satisfying answer, but um, this kind of goes back to staffing as well and really having people on your team that have different professional backgrounds um, and skill sets. You know, so, so maybe your community partner is helping you understand what's relevant to them or an agency staff is helping you understand what's really actionable and relevant. Um, I think a big misstep that some researchers make is assuming they know everything about the community space or the government space without really investing the time to learn it, right? So just because you have a degree in health policy and you've worked a lot with health data, it doesn't mean you actually know how a clinic runs or um, how a social service program is designed or what it feels like to go there for services, right? So um, some of the best researchers and the ones that I most admire spend a lot of personal time you know, out in the world uh, asking questions. I used to work a lot on public safety and I worked with an economist who would go out and uh, literally sit in the 911 center or, you know, like do these things that's kind of abnormal because 
he really just wanted to know like what I'm looking at all this data on this stuff and I, I but I need to know what's really going on. And so um, getting that mindset of really honoring the expertise of other people and seeing it as a as a learning opportunity, it can make your insights so much more actionable. Um, and it can change the quality of your research and the way you interpret data. Um, not everyone has the time to do that, especially early career, but if you can kind of build that into your funding and research model, I think that can really avoid a lot of mistakes that researchers make unintentionally. Mm -hmm. Most researchers wake up every day wanting to contribute and wanting to do the right thing. And sometimes they very unintentionally just kind of miss mm -hmm. miss because they're not aware of what's going on. I think that's, that's right on target, Janie, and I was just going to add that I think one thing that you described that I just really want to emphasize is sort of the tendency to feel like you have to explain everything, including everything that didn't work just so, and, and really honing in on the key message is so critical and, and making sure that you're not over explaining. Yeah. Build on sort of this conversation what can some of our community stakeholders that are in the audience do to influence sort of the research question as well as the policy question? Uh, I'm sure there are many folks on the line that are in communities experiencing different issues and trying to figure out how to escalate those issues up to the, the people that um, can change policy. Is there something different that they do? Uh, or is it more or less the same as what researchers are, are doing? Dr. Brown, do you want to take that one? I, I actually think it was directed at you. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> and you can uh, clarify it to me. Yeah. So, so the question is, what what can a community member do to either influence research or policy? Sure. Yeah, it's such a great question. First of all, I just want to acknowledge that researching researchers as a profession have not done a great job in in our history of being respectful of the communities that we work with and study, right? There's a long history here of um, uh, uh, of like of not really um, offering opportunities for people impacted by research to either participate in it or have a say in how it's done. Um, and I think we're in a moment where there are many more active conversations around how to be better at that. And I, I do want to just recognize that the center, the SERP center that Dr. Brown runs and, and lots of staff here are, is really designed to be an active conversation on that issue and to provide many opportunities for different community members to actively participate in research. So um, I really encourage you again to check out all their resources. Um, I think that, um, you know, researchers need to invite people into the process um, and, and hopefully, you know, nonprofits can be more active partners. I was talking to someone this week who's a longstanding executive director of a nonprofit here in LA. And she just mentioned to me in passing, she, you know, I used to really build evaluation in and I, she, she literally used the word, she's like, I kind of got lazy, you know, and now I wish I knew more about what we were doing. So, you know, if you're a community member in a position of power like that, and you can really participate in research more actively, I encourage you to do it that way. I think in terms of influencing the policy space, advocacy is really powerful. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important it is just to be active, writing your elected officials. Um, you, you can write letters, you can call them, you can ask for meetings. They track all of that. Um, I, I still write to my legislators about issues that I care about, sort of a leftover habit, you know, and it's, um, I'm sure that's many you know this from working in the White House. It all floats up, right? So. Um, even if you just feel that your uh, your agency is a single person at home, you can um, absolutely do that or connect in with these sort of broader advocacy organizations, many of which use research and research partnerships to shape their talking points and their and their agendas. Absolutely. I could probably give a better answer like on a specific issue, but um, yeah. hopefully that's enough of an answer. No, I think it's a great answer. And I, I do want to highlight the points around communication and translating whatever you're experiencing or researching to another audience. Um, I think that that holds true for a lot of community stakeholders is figuring out how to translate your lived experience, the issues that you're seeing in the community to the research space, to the policymaker. And it's really just an act of speaking different languages. And maybe 
you don't have to master every language, but you can lean on the experts in different spaces to do the same. Um, and it's really a point that you made um, quite clearly, Janie, in your presentation. Um, I'm gonna get into some of the questions that are sort of more uh, policy brief oriented. Um, so this is gonna go towards uh, Sean and Janie. Uh, these are very specific. What colors or graphics are more eye-catching for readers in your experience? Um, also, or also negative space. I'm not sure what that means, but what colors are, and graphics are more eye-catching for readers um, in the policy space uh, to, to see in, in these briefs? Sean, that one's for you. Yeah, um, it's a great question. I would highly recommend the um, Urban Institute um, thing that we're going to put out. It has a lot of things to think about in terms of the colors that you do choose. There are all kinds of issues, um, thinking through racial equity, thinking through, um, you know, what kind of hues and colors you use. So um, we um, have our own kind of set of colors that we use on all of our reports because those are just, that's just the palette that we use for CPL. Um, there's also con uh, considerations around accessibility, so color blindness. Um, I'll put in one more plug for Data Wrapper. They have an article called How to Pick More Beautiful Colors for Your Data Viz. Um, Google that. It's got a lot of really great um, insights on that. I think the negative space might be um, just uh, a reminder on policy briefs to kind of include white space on your um, reports. And I would encourage you that to, um, you know, I know you may have this thought of, oh, we're going to cram everything in and we're going to keep it to two pages. That can be really overwhelming for a reader and kind of off-putting and they may not actually even pick it up and read it if it's not, um, if you don't have some white space. Let me, let me just make an additional point here that I occurred to me as I was watching Sean. You have that slide where you talk about your editing process and you have all of these people, you know, weighing in and you you want to do that. You want to get external reviewers. You want to get your project team, your maybe you have a community advisory board working. You want to get all that input. It can be really helpful to have one or two people who've got to make final decisions because the whole point of a policy brief is, is less. You're going to have to make tough decisions about what you're not including. And you start to lose focus and you lose white space in your design when you're trying to say too much. Um, and that's one of the hardest things about writing a policy brief. It's always harder to be shorter. It requires more effort, more thinking, more discussion, more discretion, and really having that person that has been designated. It could be the principal investigator or it could be someone else who's making the final call. Some of the tables that Sean showed you, for a policy audience, you could cut out 90% of that and just show one figure, one data point, right? And, and that's even more effective, but that's a tough conversation. What are you emphasizing? What are you leaving out? What are your risks by leaving something out? That's not, those are substantive uh, conversations, but it's, it's um, your goal is white space. And once you start seeing the visual clutter, it's kind of a signal, okay, we haven't done that work yet. Another technical question. Do you recommend any specific software to make policy brief? Um, we use InDesign, which is an Adobe product that makes nice looking PDFs. Um, it is something that you do have to get trained on. It's um, got a lot of amazing features, but you do need to get trained on it. Um, I think uh, you, you could use Word or Google Docs and make those into PDF. Um, same sort of data as uh, things would apply. And I'm sure there are probably other um, things out there as well. Thanks, Sean. Um, a broader question, sorry, these questions are sort of scattered and not in any organi organized way, but have you ever separated a program or question into separate individual policy reports at different times? Um, that They may all be related, but they're sort of spaced out over time to sort of lessen the info overload. Um, how, if you've done that, how do you do that? Uh, and how, how do you decide what's included in one part of a series of reports? Absolutely. Um, anything that gets to be more focused is probably effective. It's hard to talk, to talk about it in the abstract, but I'll, I'll give you an example. This is in our work, but I was at another UC campus reviewing a lot of data collected in the field over a two-year period. There was a big survey and five separate qualitative studies, and they were trying to figure out how to write the report. And I was there to help them think about a communication strategy. And I was like, okay, eight reports over 15 months. <laughs> like, because if you try to talk about 
housing barriers and why people are homeless and their experiences on the street and the types of shelter they want all at once, you're not going to, no one's going to hear any of it. So you really need to pick mini stories. Um, so, so maybe that's an obvious example because of the amount of, of data there, but absolutely you should do that. Uh, there's no, pr probably no downside unless you're really trying to capture a window, you know, so like there's an active conversation happening in a moment where the mayor or someone's going to do something and you got to get in there, then just do everything faster and shorter. <laughs> but for the most part, you know, splitting it up is a great idea. Got several questions related to um, types of data to use in policy reports, um, questions around how do you create a policy report that incorporates focus group data versus is there a perfect data set? I guess there was conversation around uh, linking different data sets to make a specific point. Um, how do you confidently say uh, that you know a data set is uh, supporting the policy brief that you're trying to put out there? Yeah, that's that's a tough question. That actually feels um, a little bit like a research question, <clears throat> and and I will tell you that like this when you're designing your research collaboratively, really having that conversation. Then um, there are projects that we do where we are using big administrative data sets and we're linking them together, and um, we're not doing any interviews. And the thing you need to be careful about there is what is what are you not seeing in the data? You have to be super careful not to overinterpret because um, there's always gonna be what's called selection bias or like a there's gonna be people in the data and people not in the data. And you can't assume that everyone in the data looks like everyone who's not in the data. Uh, other projects, we have this conversation early on and we're we, there are so many issues around that that we won't do it unless it's mixed methods. Like we're, we're looking at the administrative data and supporting our analysis with interviews. Um, there are many projects that are wonderful that just are just qualitative. You just need to go out and talk to people and focus groups and pull out themes. Um, it really just depends on what, what your research questions are, what your expertise is. There's no right answer here. The thing I'll tell you in the policy brief is that um, I've really emphasized your findings, but you should have enough information about your methods for a person to contextualize it. Um, one of the studies we did on homelessness in LA had a lot of quantitative data and then it had some focus groups, but the focus group participation was very low. And in that case, it's essential for credibility that you're really clear. Like th these are just some preliminary ideas we got from a couple dozen people with lived experience, you know, you're not overstating that as a scientific sample, right? So it's really about no, no matter what data you're using or what your methods are being transparent. It doesn't being transparent doesn't mean having pages of description, but it's it's about being clear. So your policymaker has context. Really helpful. Um, do you ever find that policymakers critique the methods in a way um, that's not helpful to moving your agenda along? And if so, tell, can you give us an example of what that looks like? Oh, so many, so many examples. I don't know, <laughs> Dr. Brown, you want to answer this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get critiques all the time. And I think the thing to remember is there is no perfect database. There's no perfect qualitative or quantitative data set. There are always going to be limitations. Um, but, you know, as Janie said, acknowledging them. Um, and the, the key thing that I see is that um, we'll, we may present some work that we've done and then we'll get questions. And sometimes we can answer those questions because we have the data, we just didn't present it. And other times those questions are fodder for new projects. Uh, it's stuff that we didn't ask or that we didn't address and that we have to go back and, and really think about. So, so I view it as not necessarily a negative thing, but it's an iterative process where we're learning um, by presenting what we've done to a range of stakeholders, you know, so the policy audience, the community audience, the patient audience, and as well as our, our colleagues. For the final question, I'll sort of go into sort of the dissemination or how you get your information out there. Um, how exactly can I identify and contact offices or government officials to send my policy brief to? What's that process look like? Um, and what's been the most effective for you all? So um, 
It's going to depend a little bit on your policy area. Let's say that um, you really want to aim your work at the state legislature. There are online resources where you have sort of staff rosters, um, or you can look in your own, you, you can go online and map your own um, Senate or, or sort of like uh, assembly districts um, and look at the staff. The way that the, the California state legislature works, by the way, is that there are what are called consultants that work on issue committees. So if you think your, your paper is relevant to a housing committee or a poverty committee, you can send your work to that consultant and then try to get in a hearing on a, on a panel. Um, locally, LA government's very complicated, but, but let's say you're interested in health policy, you might want to look at um, the county in particular for those issues, the Department of Health Services, but certainly your five board offices, your county board of supervisors. Um, you could also write to the city. The city has a mayor, a chief administrative officer, and a city council. There are three forms of government at the city level. Um, I'd be happy to talk to anyone on this webinar about what you're trying to do. Like the federal government would take like a whole nother hour. Um, but I, I think maybe one, one thing to keep in mind is that there are sort of two kinds of policymakers. There are executive offices that run the programs and make the policy decisions. That's your governor, your agencies at the county level, your mayor, and then there are electeds. And they're sort of, they get reelected and they're often like really interested in um, sort of quickly moving issues. They don't have to run a big department. They might care about health policy, but they're not running health services. Right. Um, and sort of understanding the difference between the two, they're probably both your audience, by the mm -hmm. way, but like who really has the ability to do the thing you want to do? And it's, mm -hmm. the answer is going to change. You know, like if you want to change a law, you got to be in the elected bucket. If you want to change how your public health system runs legal clinics, you're going to have to be in your, your executive agency that's actually implementing programs. Really helpful. Thank you, Janie. And I'm sure you'll have lots of folks coming to you. <laughs> Dr. The one Brown. other thing I would add to that is I think that's a, a great answer and it really summarizes things well, is that, you know, taking a community engagement approach can help too in the, you know, bringing the stakeholders to the table, bringing, you know, the, the health staffer for someone on the board of supervisors to the table to let them know what you're doing because we're answering questions that may be important to us, but we need to understand what questions they really want answered. And sometimes that means a tweak to your approach. Sometimes it means a complete overhaul of your approach, but you really need to know what it is that they're, that what's important for them as they're making um, some policy decisions. So I think adding that to the mix can, can help in thinking about this as a collaborative effort. Well, I'd like to thank everybody on the call for their fantastic engagement and their questions. Thank you, panelists, for all of this insightful information. Um, the resources are available on the screen, um, and we'd like to thank you all very much. I don't know if Janie, Sean, and Arlene have anything that they would like to add. No, thank you all for your participation. I loved all your answers in the chat. I wasn't sure anyone would write anything. So thank you. It was nice to meet you all. And thank you again to everyone at SERP for all of your work on putting this together. Thank you. And I really want to just ask folks to give Janie and Sean a huge round of applause and Etsume a round of applause. Um, this was really informative. Uh, and I think the, the work that you do at uh, California Policy Lab is so elegant. Uh, it was really wonderful to have this insight into your process. Um, and I think it's going to help all of us do better, better research, better um, and more engaged policy. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Have a nice afternoon. Bye.